the webinar briefly um, and introduce Gordon. So Gordon, would you like to introduce yourself and we can get started? Sure thing. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, appreciate the opportunity today to be in front of you guys. I don't take that lightly and um, hope to bring some value. I think I will. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed during this uh, uh, quarantine and the COVID-19 virus is <clears throat> a lot of families are really getting back to basics. And what I mean by that is you see people getting back to the basics of um, working on their kitchen skills and, and uh, eating together and spending time together. And uh, you're seeing a lot of people spend time at Home Depot uh, working on their yards if they have the opportunity. And if they're not uh, working on their yards, they're working on their houses. And, and uh, so I think, you know, when we're in situations like these and times like these, and um, this is not unique for some of us that are a little, a little older, um, <clears throat> and it's probably not going to be uh, the last time we're going to deal with some sort of quarantine or some sort of virus. Uh, I was looking back through some of my slides, um, and it was interesting to note that, you know, um, planning your finances sometimes is not the uh, uh, sexiest thing. A lot of people will uh, avoid them. You know, I think your typical family will uh, get their financial documents and uh, when they get them in the mail, whether it's their insurance documents, their investment documents, um, nine out of 10 will get the documents and not look at them and stick them in a drawer in their kitchen and keep moving. And I think really now is the time to not do that, is take the time and um, to analyze and look at where you're at. So I'm gonna go through some basics. I think uh, you'll also get uh, a little bit of an investment uh, advice <clears throat> for what do you do now and, and how to not be so emotional, uh, which hopefully will help you because if this is really a, a logical thing to look at is looking at money is logical. It is a, um, um, a thing that I've decided to invest my life doing um, 18 years now experience in the industry, working for myself and uh, helping coach families on just making the right decisions because uh, I made all the wrong decisions. I made a lot of mistakes with my money and my finances um, and I think like so many, um, I didn't grow up with a mom and dad that uh, really taught me. Uh, that's where we learn a lot of our habits, but unfortunately, a lot, we also get bad habits there. And uh, my parents were not financially independent. They were not business owners. Um, and uh, uh, I think when things like this hit, it really gets us to start reflecting. So I'm going to hit some basics, but then also throughout these basics, uh, there's going to be some really good points that I think you can take and run with and uh, really make an impact in your family's finances from here and moving forward. So um, I didn't see my, there we go. Um, first thing I would recommend everybody look at is get back to the basics of looking at your budget. It's not a dirty word, um, but you want to create a plan. And I've got, by the way, I've got 30 minutes and I think I'm down to 25 but I've got, I'm gonna fly through some of these slides uh, just because I think this is really, um, when you focus on the basics, you got an opportunity. It's like, you know, my, mom, my wife bought a book and it was Make Your Bed and it's sitting on the uh, coffee table in our house. And because it's, it's about the basics in the household too, it's about how you start the day. But you look at statistics before the virus, before we got quarantined and it was, it's sad. 42% of this country is gonna retire broke. Um, <clears throat> two thirds of the country have inconsistent or no consistent savings plans. 40% of adults say they won't be able to cover a $400 unexpected expense. And, you know, we're in that situation now where a lot of people are relying on the government's uh, check and uh, because they didn't have an emergency fund, they weren't prepared for a rainy day. And um, um, debt in this country is at record levels. I, uh, if, if you want to look at something that's really telling, I thought about sharing it, but then I thought, I don't want to depress you guys. But you ought to go look at the U.S. debt clock and really spend some time looking at what's happening to our country right now. Um, finances and getting focused on your finances and looking at your family like it's a business is of the utmost importance. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty common for us to go to work and go get a job and go work for somebody else. And then us to expect that somebody else, that small business for most of us, um, to manage their money properly. But yet when it comes to our family finances, we rarely ever take the time to manage that and look at it like it is a business, uh, which it is. And, and if you have a business and if you're looking at it, you better have a budget and you better have 
a plan for where the expenses are and you want to get a grip on that um, and not have the, un and when the, and you know, there's unexpected. Um, and whether, whether it's saving for retirement, saving for the emergency fund, uh, you better figure out where your money is going. And even this money that's coming in right now, uh, the government stimulus checks, I know a lot of people have gotten them. And unfortunately, we're a consumer society. We get so focused on spending rather than on saving that we get to the point where we don't have any money and money is security. Having access to money is resources and security for you. It's the options that you get from managing it properly. Um, so a lot of people get caught up in the debt trap because they keep thinking tomorrow is promised. And we all know tomorrow is not promised, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a, a quarantine. Uh, and this was interesting because this has been in our slides for a long time, but to be ready for a pandemic, and we're actually right in the middle of one. Um, you look at your finances logically, and this is where we find um, most people that are out there. Most people, or here's the goal, let's put it that way. <clears throat> Sorry, this is the goal. Step one, find out where the money's going and get an ideal budget. The goal would be, you know, a third for housing and debt, 26% living expenses, 25% taxes, 4% insurance, 15% savings. That 15% savings is a sliding scale. If you're behind, if, you know, in your 50s like I am, it's probably 20% of your income, 20 cents on the dollar needs to be socked away. Uh, could be 25, could be if you're behind, it could be more than that. But and when you get a logical setup and you say, look, this is on the dollar, every dollar needs to be spent kind of this way, it's gonna help you plan it moving out of this quarantine when we get back out there. Uh, this is where I find most people are when I sit down with them. I find a third's going to debt, a third's going to taxes, a third's going to living expenses, eight to 9% is going to their insurance premiums. And they're lucky if they're getting one to 2% saved, which is just, a, can be a, it's gonna be a nightmare for their finances moving forward. Um, what I do is when I sit with people, is show people the logical way and say, look, this is what you should have, and this is where you are, I just came back from a physical therapy appointment. And anytime you go to the doctor, they're going to give you a bar of where you kind of should be and then where you are. And then if you ask for honest advice, they're going to tell you what you need to do. And uh, same thing in the financial side, <clears throat> you should have a bar of where you want to be. And then you're going to look at where you are and say, look, I need to work towards that. Um, I think it helps to have a coach, to have somebody from outside looking in, but you can look at this budget situation yourself and anybody that's interested, at the end of this, uh, I'm gonna have a couple of links for you. So you'll have a, a free booklet for joining us today. And then I'm gonna give you a free budget worksheet, which is just really getting back to the fundamentals. Um, you look at how much money's coming in and then how much is going out. And it's really an eye opener. And when I say that, more often than not, people will pull up their bank statements because they've never put any kind of pen to paper and figured out where is it going. Um, and so what you want to do is get every financial statement that you have. It's time to pull them out. If you haven't pulled them out for your taxes, uh, I know I haven't. I've been procrastinating. Uh, now I've got till July, thankfully. But, uh, but I'm always on top of all my financial stuff, so it's an easy thing. Mine's filed. I just don't want to pay because I'm, I drag. I, I pay every year. I don't want to pay. So I, I drag my feet on paying my taxes. Uh, but gather all your statements and then look at all your sources of income. And that's gonna be looking at a cash flow planning system. And you wanna create monthly living expenses, list them out. You know, there's gonna be um, the ones that you have to, and, and this is just a budget worksheet where you plug everything in, but there's gonna be expenses that you have to pay. We call them fixed expenses. And those are gonna be your, you know, maybe it's your rent, your mortgage, maybe it's your car payment, maybe it's your auto insurance bill, internet, things that you can't negotiate on and then you've got the variable, which is the negotiable expenses. And I've heard that, you know, some people say it's, a, you know, stuff that's above the line or below the line. And, uh, and I challenge even some people on the credit card payments. If you're really in a bad situation, I'd say the credit card payments can wait because the bank will be okay. Uh, your credit score might be impacted. But if you're in a really bad situation, I'd rather have my credit score go down and my cash reserves go up. And so that would be more of the variable, in my opinion. So I... I sometimes tell people to smooth that credit card down, but it really just depends on your situation. But the variable expenses can be managed with a cash envelope system. If you really need uh, help uh, managing money, that is a great way to do that. And what I mean by that is, is you get a, an actual envelope and you decide this is your budget at the beginning of the month. Let's say you've got $200 to eat out. 
or let's say it's 400, whatever the budget is, or even if it's groceries and that's your budget, well, you don't break it. You go to the grocery store and you, and you spend differently. You go out to eat differently. Uh, you ask people, you know, at the end of the month, if you don't have any money in your envelope and it's eating out money, you don't just say, hey, let's go throw, I deserve it. Let's go put it on my debt and let's go rack up my MasterCard or my Visa. No, you just say, I'm staying in tonight. It's movie night for me. Uh, I got a pass. And, and you just make judgment calls rather than I deserve it. And then you rack up debt. You, you got to make judgment calls on the variable expenses in the budgeting and say, look, I'm going to stick to this because of the utmost importance is my emergency fund, is my retirement accounts, um, add all your monthly income, all your monthly expenses. And, uh, and if the income, excuse me, if the income is greater, you're in a good situation. If the income is less, then you got a challenge. And that's a good thing to know when you do have a challenge. Because when you do have a challenge, you got to say, okay, I got to figure out ways to drive my income up. Because I'm, what's happening is my business or my family business is going to go bankrupt. And I'm going to get to a certain age and I'm not going to have anything. And that's not the name of the game. The name of the game is to accumulate your assets, make money, put it aside, and you got to make adjustments. It's not very glamorous. Um, and, you know, I kind of hit that already. So I'm going to run through that. But look at the variable expenses. Look for ways to cut back. Look for ways that you are blowing money. Uh, and it's inevitable. You can ask anybody out there. You know, I've been doing this for years. But there's books written about the latte factor. David Bach talked about it in one of his books. He talked about how people, you know, they get an addiction to Starbucks. And, and, and people laugh about it. And I think it's, you know, it can be funny. But it can also be a little sad. Because the sad part is when you laugh about it, you got an addiction to Starbucks and Starbucks is now five bucks and you do that five to seven days a week, that's an IRA uh, investment that you could be putting away. That's an emergency fund that you could be building because that's, that's seven days a week, that's $35 every single week and $35 every single week with 52 weeks in the year. All of a sudden you're talking about some serious money that's going out the window and you're, it's going to, because it's, you know, going to Starbucks and, you know, Starbucks is fine. They don't need your one more sale every day of the latte. You might need that to keep that, um, you know, delayed gratification. You know, we live in a microwave society. It's like everything is now Amazon now order now get it tomorrow. And unfortunately that's a diabolically opposed to you building assets. It goes right in the face of you saving money. And so learning how to delay your gratification, get it later, is such a powerful tool to implement and learn and study. And because um, when you stick to a budget, you know, you start feeling better. You start realizing, you know what, this is working. I've got this money that I'm accumulating now. Um, and, and reviewing that on a consistent basis, not just once a year, you know, because it's interesting to me that people will spend a year planning for a wedding, which lasts a day and really the ceremony is maybe an hour and they'll spend a year planning that, but yet they won't spend any time and they'll skip the budget. They'll skip the financial coaching. They'll skip the emergency fund. They'll skip all these other things because they don't want to delay gratification. They want to go out and, and party on Friday night. And I get it. I like to party. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I love that kind of stuff. And I, I never entertain when, you know, when we weren't being quarantined. Now it's the wife and I at the house with wine and good food, but it's not, the first thing we put our money in, the first thing we put our money in is in our own uh, accounts. And the most of this country lives in this debt cycle and where the finances are controlled by you and you don't control your finances. You outspend your income, you borrow to maintain a lifestyle, you pay off one debt, you accrue another debt. And here's where you want to get to. You want to get to where you're in a cash cycle. You control your finances. You need to get debt free. It's like, uh, Let's put it this way. It's, it's financial cancer. For as long as you're in debt, that's the, you know, you're not going to be able to retire. You're not going to be able to uh, reduce your stress. Stress is highest when you have a lot of debt. Um, so pay off, uh, pay off your debts, get out of debts and start saving and investing, accumulating assets, learn to live in a cash cycle. Uh, every time you go out, have cash on hand. It's opposite of what society wants you to do because right now everybody wants you to use everything virtual. And I promise you, that is not very emotional. You know, if you got a $100 bill in your wallet or your purse, you're much more emotionally attached to that $100 bill than you are pulling out your credit card and just swiping it through the machine at Costco or 
any of these other restaurants. And we've been spending a lot of money in the last um, since we've been quarantined the last few weeks, eating out, you know, exploring some of these places to eat out with. But we got to be careful there too, because I've seen people, I've had some conversations with people that are like, my grocery bill is going through the roof because I'm using um, um, Instacart and they've got an extra upcharge. And then I'm ordering everything in and there's an extra upcharge. And I, and I just challenge people, I say, look, you want to support these businesses, but you don't want to support these businesses if your business is going down the tubes. You don't want to support the business of Instacart if you're going to go broke, you know, so be careful with that. Live within a cash cycle. And it's the biggest risk to our security is the debt that's out there. Um, you learn how to have a solution. Here's three steps. Step number one, learn how to invest. Pay yourself first. You want to set up three fundamental accounts. Eliminate debt and then protect yourself along the way. Protect your income. Um, three fundamental accounts you're going to always want to have. And I know some of you are going, man, we're in it right now. Okay, great. We're in it and we're going to get out of it. And you, but if you're in a situation now with no emergency fund, it's not my fault. It's your fault because you didn't look at this beforehand and you've got to look at this now and say, this is never going to happen again. And, and I say, get frustrated, get angry at it and say, this is the end. Three fundamental accounts, get an emergency fund. You want three months of living expenses. As you get closer to retirement, it's probably two years worth of living expenses. The more cash you have, the better off you're going to be. But it, while we're working, it's three to six months. I tell small business owners, it should probably be a year because if you're not dependent on, you know, if you don't have an employer or a big company, you got, you're dependent on you. The more cash reserves you have, the better you are. And I figured out, a long time ago, there's a direct correlation from your attitude and your smile. And all of that is tied to what's in the pocketbook, what's in the, what's in the wallet. If you got a good attitude on life, you got a good, you know, a lot of times it's tied to how you're managing the money that's behind the scenes. And if you're upset or ticked off, it's a lot of times because you've mismanaged what you have. Um, there's gonna be an uncovered medical expense. We're all gonna have them. Um, major car repairs, it's just being, and saying, hey, uh, I know I'm going to have a car breakdown. It's not going to be a surprise when it happens. I know I'm going to have a health issue. It cannot be a surprise when it happens. And same thing for this situation. I know there's going to be a quarantine again in the future. There's going to be a health scare. I know it, so I'm going to embrace it, and I'm going to be prepared for it. Um, purchases the next couple of years. Um, the second account, short-term accounts. And that's where you start getting into, hey, I want to plan. I want to plan for the uh, unforeseen event of maybe a loss of a job and a change. I want to plan for maybe if I get disabled uh, or it's going to be maybe I get I need to plan for my next car or if it's you know some folks might say I want to plan for my retirement home. Whatever that might be a little bit more short term but acts you have accessibility to those accounts. Um, down payment for a house purchased within the next three to five years. Three fundamental accounts the wealth building account the goal there retirement that's long term. Uh, that's where you start getting into talking about Roth and traditional IRAs. Uh, that's where you get into talking about 401ks, where there's a match. You want to go where you get free money. If you don't have free money, you want to go into tax-free accounts like Roth IRAs or tax-deferred accounts like uh, traditional IRAs. Um, and then you look at what do, I, what do I have every month to work with? And this is how you kind of break it down. You say, look, I want to put 50% of that money into an emergency fund. So the first thing that I'm always talking to individuals about when they come to me for investment advice, I say, we got to look at your emergency fund because if we start going into investments, and I think the, you know, there's so much information out there today, but information tends to paralyze. There's so many applications out there today and applications I don't know that are necessarily helping. I'm seeing people that are on uh, Acorn. I'm seeing people that are on uh, Robinhood and all these different apps that are allowing people to buy into stocks, yet they don't have the three fundamental accounts or they're buying a stock when they should be buying a mutual fund for diversification. And, and they don't even know, they just think, well, you know, maybe this is the time, I had somebody tell me the other day they should buy oil, that was a month ago, but what happened to oil? What happened to the oil companies? Um, so have three fundamental accounts, save first, invest first, uh, short-term account, wealth building account, Spread your, and that could be, you could have $100 a month and do this. $50 here, $25 here, $25 here. It could be 1000 a month. It's your budget and your plan. Uh, the emergency fund, where would that go? And things like money market accounts. 
uh, short-term accounts, conservative allocation. It might be more in the, your bonds. And then you got wealth building accounts. Those are more in your stocks and equities. And I'm going to hit that in a minute because a lot of you are going, well, he needs to talk about investing right now because the market's down. And I will. Give me one minute. But the fundamentals don't change even in a quarantine. Um, just a real quick overview of the three different types of funds or you have growth funds and it's primarily going to be in common stock. I'm not going to go into reading all of these for you because of the time constraints today, but growth funds, it's going to be in your stock related companies. Cause right now there's a lot of companies that are doing well during this crisis. I've heard that the uh, alcohol industry is up, I think 200%. It's going through the roof. Total wine is not giving coupons right now. Um, so what else? Uh, uh, Home Depot doing well, Costco doing well, Amazon, the biggest one out there doing incredibly well. So understand there are a lot of opportunities out there and uh, uh, understanding also what's an income fund. And that's where you start getting into more debt related instruments, uh, corporate, government, municipal debt securities. And then you've got balanced funds, which give you a little bit of both. So those are some of the funds you'll see when you're out there and you're looking and you're talking to an advisor. Are you getting investment coaching? Um, and you look at, the, you know, what's the idea of a mutual fund? Because a lot of people have heard of them, but they really don't know what they are. And in simplistic terms, it's the easiest way to explain it. It's a pool of investors that take their money collectively and they give it over to a money manager. And, you know, it's Baltimore is an interesting city because it has two of, one, two of the biggest investment companies out there. It's got T. Rowe Price and Leg Mason. Leg Mason just got sold to Franklin Templeton, so it's no longer going to be based in Baltimore, but two big vendors. I mean, and we've got access to all these companies these days like never before, but for the most, for the average individual doing it by themselves, they make mistakes because they end up doing this emotionally. And that's why so many of these companies are also, they're selling when they shouldn't sell and people are buying when they shouldn't buy. But um, understanding what you're investing in, you got to realize that, look, uh, all these companies are making money and it's going to be not every single one of them, but a lot of them. And, um, and to spread your risk out through a mutual fund, letting a fund manager do that for you and you with a strategy is the way to do it. Um, and typical fund will hold 150 stocks where if somebody's trying to do it themselves, they're buying one or two Z's at a time and it's too high a risk for your financial house. It's something you can do outside of building your financial house, but it's not something I would do inside of my financial house, meaning my retirement accounts, the stuff that I depend on, the three fundamental accounts. If you want to buy stocks, do it after you funded your three to six month emergency fund. Do it after you got a short term investment account. Do it after you got your retirement account. Do it after even if you got kids, your 529s are funded. But after you've done all those things, most people don't have much left over if they've even gotten to all of those things. So um, why most people need advice? Well, you look at what happens emotionally with people. And, you know, it wasn't long ago, everybody was calling and saying, hey, I need to get in the market. I need to get in the market. And now emotionally, people are saying, I want to get out of the market. I want to get out of the market. But if you notice these purple boxes, area of maximum financial risk. Well, the maximum financial risk was really six months ago. Market was up you know, thrill, euphoria, excitement. Uh, people think now's the time to get in when it's really, you've missed a lot of the opportunity. And we're now in a mode where it's fear, desperation, panic. I think we're really on the downward end of this curve where you're getting into capitulation and despondency. And we gotta be careful because that's the opportunity zone. For any folks that, don't, that do have money on the sideline, I've got a lot of folks that are putting money in now because they're realizing now's the time to buy because they're buying into the ingenuity of people that are uh, building these companies. It's the sweat, the blood, and the tears that are going into the companies that have built our world and built the economy. And you think that's, you know, so I think that the scary part is people that say, well, we're not coming back from this. Well, we've come back from worse things in the past. So let me tell you this, I believe I believe in my fellow entrepreneurs out there. I believe in the economy. I believe in, uh, you know, that we're going to have a great season with the Ravens this year. I don't know what it's going to look like in the stadium, but I think we're going to, we got some exciting times ahead. And with exciting times, I mean, the market where we're at now is only going to start going back up. And so now is really the time to get your house in order and say, hey, 
I need to start because I haven't been. Um, what's a mutual fund? We kind of hit that. It's a pool of money. So I'm going to run through that. Uh, three D's of investing, um, dollar cost averaging, discipline, and diversification. Dollar cost averaging is just buying every month. It's buying every month. Right now, I, you know, I've, I've, most of my clients have stayed in the course, but I tell people, look, great time right now. But I've gotten the calls and they go, well, my portfolio is down. I say, wait a second, your number of shares are the same, if not growing, because you're buying them on sale. So dollar cost averaging is a magic piece that so many people miss. Discipline, stay the course, stop reading the news. The news is, is, uh, is noise, I call it. Uh, look at history, uh, watch the history channel, watch the discovery channel. That's how we re are gonna react moving forward. Things are gonna change, we're gonna get out of this. So have the discipline. And then diversification is uh, just the simple idea there. Think about this. If your family, you and your family are at the um, uh, Empire State Building, New York City, and, and it's open again, and you're getting on an elevator. Elevator A, one cable, strong enough to handle the family, and it's safe, but elevator B has 50 cables. You got a choice. Do you get on elevator A or do you get on elevator B? Everybody that I ask says, I'm on elevator B. Well, that's diversification. That's spreading your risk out. That's not buying the one stock that you have access to on your phone. That's going through a mutual fund manager, letting them spread your risk and what that looks like in a rising market and what that looks like in a fluctuating market and what it looks like in a fluctuating market. And that, Kathleen, I'm going to be done right at 1230. And then I'll, if there's a question and we need to stay on, I can. But what it looks like in a fluctuating market is in a fluctuating market, you're buying more shares. 126 shares purchased, same money over that same period of time. You buying in a market that was going up and up and up, you buy fewer shares. Right now is an opportunity to own more of the United States global market, to own more of your, I mean, you can walk into any home in America and find their consumers, they're buying products. I mean, I think you walk around my house, you got Adidas, you got Nike, you got Under Armour. Um, in the sporting world, you've got uh, uh, Procter & Gamble. You've got so many companies that are being consumed today, but yet so few people own shares in them. Uh, debt stacking. I'm going to kind of, I need to move through this kind of quick, but the idea there is that you can have a plan, and, and this is putting together a strategy following what, what uh, um Consumer credit has been teaching for years is how to have a strategy to pay off your debts. And in this scenario, this showed a client how they were going to pay off everything in 23 years. We showed them how to pay it off in nine years by not taking, when you get done with the, the smallest balance, you take the smallest balance, that payment, and roll it into the next one so you can pay off your debt sooner. And so, you know, as you're moving forward and as time's progressing, you're getting yourself out of debt, mortgage and everything included. And, uh, we, I love the fact of showing people how to get out of debt, including a mortgage, so they can one day get in a position so they can retire. Um, and the other thing I would tell you, too, is look at your insurances. You know, I know Dennis Klein, I don't know if he's on here with us today, but he does a good job of shopping your auto and homeowners insurance. Um, uh, I do a good job of helping people look at their income protection plan, making sure that if they're gone, because there's two things gonna happen in life. One is we live a long life, and that's what we've been talking about is planning for a long life. But the other side is you don't live a long life, and if you don't, you need some good term life insurance. It's the most economical way to protect your family, and it's a big opportunity for a lot of folks out there that get led down the wrong path, and I was years ago. So get a good term policy to replace your income, and um, understand life, uh, in life, you need a lot, the younger you are, a lot of life insurance, because you don't have a lot of money saved, but as you go through life, you better start accumulating assets. In the later years of life, you don't need much life insurance. You, don't, you get to the point where you don't need any if you've done the right things with your money. Life insurance is needed for the young families more though, so than it is for the retirees. So um, that's it. That's my part. I got 1231, Kathleen. I don't know if there's any chat or qu questions or messages that I need to address. It's such an amazing job. And I know I felt like we need like another 15 minutes for you, but... Um... There is a question from Beano from Shore United Bank. She said she wanted to thank you for doing this seminar and she's checking on how you um, are dealing with your clients during this pandemic and the stocks being down and you being their financial advisor. So how are you kind of calming the, the, the nerves, I guess? Yeah, 
I think maybe some of that was answered at the end there, but the main thing to remember is this too shall pass. Um, and I know that's easy to say, but when you look at the fundamentals, you know, we, we still have 350 million people in the United States. Uh, we still have, you know, these are a lot of consumers and money is going to be flowing again. It's flowing now in different places, but it's going to be flowing again. And we're going to be putting gas back into cars. We're going to be running around town. We're going to be going out to eat again. And I know there's going to be some attrition, but if you have a diversification strategy, if you have a plan, you should not, like I said, be focused on buying one stock or one individual uh, uh, company out there. Can you win? Yeah, you can win, but you can also lose. And for the most part, most people do because they don't have access to the resources that are at these investment companies. And I'd say, if you got a strategy, like I said, you know, if you've got a thousand bucks a month, 500 should be an emergency fund. That's money market accounts. That's where being all, you know, the checking accounts and money market accounts and banks come into play for some of that stuff. And then the other piece of that's the short term and the, uh, and the long term. And that's where you get into, uh, if you get good diversification, um, yeah, your, your funds might look like they're down, but the number of shares are up because you're continuing to buy. And, you know, we pride ourselves in very few people are cashing out, yet a ton of people are cashing out where they're doing it with no advice. And that's probably the biggest difference. The thing I'll, I'll tell you is I see the people with advisors are winning because they're not dumping everything when, and they're not panicking. Um, and that's, like I said, that's when you have a coach, it's easy to say that because uh, it's, but when it's your money and you're looking at it, and you don't have a coach, I've seen people all the time make the biggest mistakes and they're dumping their stocks right now and putting it in cash and they're going to miss out on the big shifts. And we've had some shifts. So hopefully you, know, you made me laugh when you talked about the put your cash in envelopes. That's exactly what my mother did um, when she first got married and, you know, to my dad and stuff, they would actually have envelopes and they would put their cash in it. And that was what it was. So um I, that made me, my mom would be very happy to hear that you're still giving that advice. Um, well, I, know, I know we're a little over time, but I didn't yeah. want you to gloss over the one thing toward the end, which was how to pay down your debt faster, um, the, the stacking. So yeah. over that one more time, because I really do think that's important. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> It's really on this side, and uh, let me close that real quick. I'm looking at the chat too. Um, here's what it says. It says take, and, and this is sometimes um, counter, or let's put it this way, it's opposite of what you might think, because I get a lot of clients, they'll say, well, let me pay off my highest uh, interest account first, you know, because if you got different credit cards, and you got one credit card that's 24% interest, and you got one, I get it. And that's where a lot of people want to go, but understand psychology and how we operate. I'm going to challenge people and we challenge people, go for the smallest balance debt that you have first. Okay. And whatever extra you have, you got, and sometimes you got to be careful there because a lot of people will pour everything towards the debt and they don't get the emergency fund going. And that's a big mistake. You've got to get the emergency fund going and a plan to encapsulate and pay off debt. And what I mean by encapsulate is once you start saving in your emergency fund, you can take your debt and say, this is my debt and I'm not going to grow it because I am saving money, but then I'm going to, I've got to have a plan to pay this off in 10 years. And I think, not I think, I know anybody that's hearing me, whether it's now or you come back later on, listen, you can put a plan in place to pay everything off in 10 years, including a mortgage. Okay. And you do it by taking the smallest one that you have. And when you pay it off, that's when you do a little celebration. That's when you reward yourself and you say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to eat out. I'm going to have a glass of wine. I'm going to have a bottle of wine. I'm going to have whatever. And I'm going to celebrate. I paid it off, but I'm going to take that minimum payment and I'm going to dump it down onto the next smaller account that I have to get rid of. And what happens is it's called a debt stacking or a debt steamroll or debt snowball. It's like a diet. You know, I've, we've all done diets before. And if you don't get any progress, you get, um, you get depressed you know, you get disappointed. And it's the same thing with debt. If you don't get any progress with it, because you're going after a $15,000 credit card, you're going to get depressed. So go after the small one first, go after the, you know, the $1,000 credit card first, pay it off, take the minimum payment, dump it onto the next, take the minimum payment, dump it onto the next. And what ends up happening is 
This same dollar amount is being spent every month. $2,700 is spent every month, $2,720. From the moment we sat with them to the moment we showed them how to pay everything off. But in the end, their mortgage payment was getting $2,700 instead of $1,200. At some point, you know, these, all these, like the car loan, at some point it was $551, but now all of a sudden they were getting $1,100. So that extra money is all going to the principal payments. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that was just, uh, I think it's really, really interesting, um, the psychi psychiatry of that. So yeah. I wanted to make sure that everybody um, understood what that stacking meant. Yep. So Gordon, once again, thank you so, so much for doing this for us. Um, I thank everyone for tuning in. And hopefully this gave you some ideas about how to look at money um, now during the pandemic and going into the future. Um, that your personal finances are a business and you have to look at it like that and that by spending cash is a little bit harder than on a credit card. So maybe that's another change you can make at this time and going forward. Um, so Gordon, you are always um, great at giving us information. Please reach out to Gordon uh, if you would like some help, some coaching, as he says, um, on how to set yourself up and, and get out of this and then move forward in your financial planning. We will, um, this has been recorded, so uh, we will be uploading this into our YouTube channel. And uh, so you can come back and, and take another listen and share it for us as well. So thanks Kathleen, Gordon and good. I hope, yeah. Quick question, the budget worksheet and the, uh, and the, the booklet on just education, it's I've got a How Money Works book. Um, can I, what would be the best way if somebody wants those that, that I can? I'll tell them? you what, send, send those to me and I'll email all the attendees. Okay. Um, and attach it. Okay. Sounds all good. right. Okay, everybody, have a wonderful Wednesday and uh, keep moving, keep going, and we will see you back in a few weeks. So thanks again, Gordon. Absolutely. Next time we all go out to eat and, and have fun, I guess we'll be spending more cash. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the cash is king. All right. All right.